Wolf Creek Pass doesn't rush you. It lets you believe you have time, time to settle in, time to adjust, time to fix whatever starts to feel wrong. Drivers leave the summit calm and controlled, in gear, under speed, Jake break on, exactly what they were trained to do. And for a while, nothing happened. But eight miles of 7% grade quietly spin the margin those systems depend on. Heat builds up, options narrow, and the road never gives you a moment to get it back. And when your time finally runs out, it doesn't announce itself. It just reminds you the wolf has been waiting the whole way down. This was the reality of Wolf Creek Pass when trucks first began using it in volume. The road itself hadn't changed much, but traffic had. As freight moved deeper into southwest Colorado, heavier trucks began committing to a descent that earlier roads and braking systems were never designed to manage for long. Early engine brakes were very limited. Service brakes carried the load. And once the driver tipped over the summit, there were very few places to recover what had already been lost. Wolf Creek caught drivers off guard, not because it felt dangerous at the top, but because it waited until the descent was already underway. It didn't take long for the pass to earn a reputation among truckers, among locals, and among highway crews who worked the wrecks at the bottom. By the mid-1970s, Wolf Creek was already legendary, dangerous enough and familiar enough to be woven into American trucking culture. When C.W. McCall penned his song, he wasn't warning drivers about something new. He was putting words to danger, a pass that lulled the uninitiated into confidence, then punished them for believing it. And while decades of engineering, enforcement, and technology have reshaped this road, the fundamental problem never went away. Welcome back to Beyond the Exit. My name is Scott, and I'm going to be your host on this trip down Wolf Creek Pass to understand how the legend and its lasting danger was built. Why build a road here at all? When people talk about dangerous mountain passes, they usually start with the danger. But with Wolf Creek, the better question comes first. Why put a road through here at all? Long before it carried trucks or warning signs, Wolf Creek was already known as a crossing through the San Juan Mountains. Indigenous peoples, like the Ute, moved through this region seasonally, crossing high ground only when conditions allowed and avoiding it entirely when winter made the mountains impassable. This was never an easy route. That understanding began to erode in the late 1800s. As mining, timber, and agriculture expanded across southwest Colorado, isolated communities needed a reliable connection between the San Juan River Valley and the San Luis Valley. Early planners tried to avoid the high divide altogether, favoring routes further south. The top candidate for this was a location called Elwood Pass. It was lower elevation and had gentler grades, a route that seemed definitely easier to manage. But in practice, it failed. Seasonal runoff washed sections away. Unstable ground collapsed under repeated use, and flooding cut the route off for weeks at a time. It couldn't provide what southwest Colorado needed most, a crossing that stayed open. Wolf Creek won that argument not because its grades were easy, but because its geology was predictable. It was chosen because despite its difficulty, it was solid ground that could be built upon. As roads improved and Colorado's highway network expanded, that crossing became part of US-160. This designation didn't soften the terrain or rework the alignment. It simply changed what the road was expected to carry. What had once been a difficult regional passage was now a federal corridor over the Continental Divide, tasked with moving people and freight year-round. The geometry of this road was already locked in. Long climbs, long descents, and no easy way around. For a time, the trade-off worked, mainly because vehicles were slower and loads were lighter. But Wolf Creek wasn't built for what came next. It just happened to be standing there when it arrived. When the balance broke. For decades, Wolf Creek Pass functioned within the limits of the vehicles using it. Early traffic moved slowly. Loads were modest. Drivers understood that the road demanded patience, not speed. Under those conditions, the descent was difficult, but survivable. But that balance didn't last. After World War II, freight volumes increased and loads grew heavier. US-160 was no longer just a regional road. It became a working corridor across the Continental Divide. And Wolf Creek was suddenly expected to handle sustained commercial descents it had never been designed for, and the road really couldn't change to meet the demand. The descent remained long and uninterrupted, 
Grades stayed steep and flat ground really never arrived, and while the mountain pass never changed, the vehicles using it grew heavier and faster. That was especially critical in older trucks. Early engine brakes were weak or non-existent. Retarders were rare. Brake systems relied mostly on large drum brakes that trapped heat and lost effectiveness as temperatures climbed, often known as brake fade, which would inevitably lead to brake failure. Today's modern trucks are much better equipped with electronic safety devices, engine retarders, and systems that help manage long, heavy downhill descents. But none of that changed the shape of the road, and it still demands respect regardless of the era. That's because the danger wasn't immediate. As we said, drivers could leave the summit under control and stay that way for miles, everything feeling manageable. But Wolf Creek didn't fail systems all at once. It let the descent unfold quietly narrowing options as the road stretched on without relief. And then the pass would make its real demand. On the westbound descent, the road funnels every mistake toward a single decision point. Two runaway truck ramps appear in sequence, not as conveniences, but almost as warning. The first comes early, the chance to admit something isn't right. The second sits lower, just before the most dangerous part of the drive. Beyond that point, the road tightens into two hairpin turns back to back. If a truck passes the last ramp without control, there is no more room to recover. The road demands a hard reduction in speed, exactly where braking capability is most likely to be weakest. That's where most runaway crashes end. Not at the summit, not mid-descent, but right at the intersection of geometry and physics. For the uninitiated, by the time the danger becomes obvious, Commitment is already complete. Pullouts are thin and the grade holds strong. And the road delivers its sharpest curve at the bottom of the hill, where there is almost nothing left to give back. That sequencing is a real trap. Wolf Creek doesn't chase drivers down the mountain. It waits patiently, then bears its teeth. Problems on both sides of the mountain. The westbound descent wasn't the only danger on Wolf Creek Pass. It was just the most visible one. On the east side, the problem wasn't runaway trucks, it was the mountain itself. Steep volcanic slopes shed rock constantly, especially with Colorado's freeze and thaw cycle. Slides and falling debris turned sections of the highway into recurring hazards, especially in winter and during spring runoff. After years of snowsheds to help divert this, Construction of a more permanent solution in the form of a tunnel began in May 2003, wrapping up in 2005. However, on the west side, CDOT still faced a problem that offered no similar solution. There was no unstable cliff to shield and no single choke point to bypass. The danger wasn't falling onto the road, it was unfolding along it. Mile after mile, its gravity did exactly what it always does. The two deadly hairpin turns waiting at the bottom, and geography and engineering couldn't erase that. So instead of trying to remove the danger, CDOT began focusing on something harder, forcing drivers to recognize it before it was too late. That shift completely changed how the west side was treated. The road stopped being side like a typical mountain highway and started being marked like a warning corridor and messages became diagrammatic instead of generic. Drivers weren't just told that a steep grade existed, they were shown where they were on it, what was coming next, and how little room remained to recover. The two-truck runaway ramps, already in place, became reference points instead of just footnotes. Every warning upstream was designed to point toward them, not as user safety deaths, but as decisions that couldn't be postponed. Miss them and the road would make the next choice for you. Speed awareness became part of that strategy as well, not just to control vehicles, but to confront drivers with their own momentum. Enforcement followed the same philosophy. Brake checks and patrols weren't about punishment, they were about intervention. In other words, stopping problems at the summit before gravity had time to turn small misjudgments into irreversible ones. None of this softened Wolf Creek Pass. What it did was strip away ambiguity. On the west side, the danger couldn't be engineered out of existence. It could only be made more visible. The facts behind the legend. By this point, Wolf Creek Pass has earned its reputation, but none of it is abstract. On the westbound side, US 160 starts at the summit of Wolf Creek Pass at 10,857 feet above sea level. From that point, the highway drops approximately 3,800 feet in elevation over 8.1 miles of continuous downhill travel. The posted grade on the descent is 
sustained for most of that distance, with no extended flat sections to interrupt the drop. That geometry matters because the road concentrates its most restrictive features later in the descent, culminating in the two tight hairpin turns on the west side that are located approximately 6.5 miles below the summit, after more than 75% of the total elevation loss has already occurred. As with most of Colorado's mountain passes, this is not a lightly traveled corridor. According to CDOT, traffic counts for the westbound segment of 160 over Wolf Creek carries an average of 4,400 vehicles across a day, with commercial vehicles making up 12 to 15 percent of that volume, depending on the season. And while those numbers describe the road on a clear, dry day, it adds another layer of complexity with the weather. The pass sits on one of the highest precipitation corridors in Colorado. Long-term NOAA and snowtail data from the Wolf Creek Summit area show average snowfall around 390 to 430 inches, and snowfall is recorded from October through May, with it not being uncommon to see measurable snow events outside that window as well. Wind data from the National Weather Service station near the summit shows average sustained wind speeds of 15 to 25 miles an hour, with recorded gusts exceeding 50 miles an hour during storm events when combined with the snow, often result in whiteout conditions. During wintertime, maintaining the west side of the pass requires a dedicated regional workforce. The maintenance district responsible for Wolf Creek operates with more than 30 full-time road crews, supported by dozens of specialized snow and avalanche response vehicles, including plows, liquid de-icer units, and traction control trucks. During winter storms, those crews cycle continuously to keep the descent open, often under conditions where accumulation and wind work faster than the removal. But even with all the effort to maintain the pass and its safety awareness, the west side still shows a consistent failure pattern. Over a recent five-year period, 47 semi-truck crashes were recorded on the westbound descent, including three fatal accidents with the majority of those incidents clustered near the lower switchback area. And that's the reality behind the legend. Wolf Creek Pass doesn't rely on its stories to be dangerous. It has the cold, hard facts to back it up. And if you'd like to take a look at this, all the data referenced here is drawn from publicly available transportation, safety, and weather records. Source material and supporting documentation are listed in the video description for those that I can imagine would want to dig even deeper. For over a hundred years, Wolf Creek Pass has carried people across it. The road itself hasn't changed nearly as much as our ability to understand what it asks of the people who use it. That's the reality behind the legend, and it's why Wolf Creek Pass still demands respect long after the stories fade. Well, we hope you enjoyed our story. Maybe you're a professional driver or just a commuter, and you've got a story you want to tell. Well, leave it in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, if you would, please hit the like button. That helps it go farther on YouTube. And we'd love it if you would share it with someone you think would enjoy it as well. You know, we love telling the stories from the roads that move us. And maybe that's something you enjoy too. If so, why don't you join us on this caravan and subscribe to the channel? You know, beyond the exit, we're always looking for history that's just hiding in plain sight. We know you can be other places. We're happy that you're here. We want to say thank you and God bless. I want to give a special thank you and shout out to Interstate Kyle, who has provided us with all of this 4K driving footage. It means a lot to us to have this extra context. If you would go over and check out some of the content they have, we'll leave a link to one of his videos and a link to his channel in our description.